You are neither an Arahant, nor have you entered the path to Arahantship. You don't even have the practice whereby you would become an Arahant or enter the path to Arahantship. These words were uttered by a certain Devata to Bahia of the Bark Cloth. Although these words were spoken long ago, they remain relevant today. Let's talk about it. This image illustrates the kind of thing that's going on. Over the past 2,500 years, there has been a proliferation of false paths. There were false paths 2,600 years ago at the time of the Blessed One. And some of these have continued on. But there's also been a proliferation of new false paths that are derived from the Dhamma, influenced by the Dhamma. Instances where people have taken inspiration from the true teaching but decided to make changes to it, to put their own spin on it, so that they could set themselves up as authorities in that and gain fame, fortune, etc. In doing this, however, because of these base motivations, they had no allegiance to the truth. It didn't matter to these people that these false paths didn't lead to the end of suffering. That wasn't the point. In fact, many of them expressly moved the goalpost to something more in line with the Brahmin belief system. So here, for example, we might have Zen is over here, and Tibetan Buddhism is over here, and Kuladasa, Daniel Lingram, Pa Ok, the Vasudhimaga Jhanas, and Jeffrey S. Brooks, a.k.a. Jananda, Ajahn Brahm, all of this is over here on these peaks. There are a lot of people over on these peaks. And here we've got Vipassana, Mahasi Sayada, Goenka, any kind of Vipassana. And just every little, every little mountain, every little peak, just like in a Bob Ross painting, each one of these has its own little school of thought way of practice. Little happy accidents, little meditators going along that path, feeling like they're making progress toward this peak experience. And in fact, there's a lot here. This is where the mundane psychic powers can be found. This is this little peak here might be all of the LSD, DMT, psilocybin, ayahuasca type experiences are on one of these peaks. You've got transcendental meditation, psychology, mindfulness-based intervention, meditation apps, Swami Nityananda, Sadguru, Carlos Castaneda, just everything you've ever heard of in terms of meditation, spirituality, anything like that, it can all be found represented here. Wim Hof is in here somewhere, probably in the wet part down here. So, there's something to see. There's an entertainment factor to this. It's kind of like going to an amusement park, and there are, there are lots of different rides and games and things to see. And that's part of the problem. People are seeing things. They're having experiences. Say you have somebody who's on the peak of this LSD experience. Well, you had to take a big dose to get that. And maybe they talk to someone on this Daniel Ingram peak over here. 
and they find that they have a lot in common. It sounds like the same experience. And they might decide that all roads lead to Rome and all spiritual paths are the same and lead to the same result and this kind of thing. So there's a lot going on here. There are people moving from one one of these to another. This person has tried all of this and decides to go climb the Twim Hill and tries that. And they see something different. And just as they were infatuated with Daniel Ingram when they were following him, they're infatuated with Delson Armstrong when they're following Twim over here. And part of where the confusion arises is people will climb these peaks. Someone will climb up the Twim Peak and say, well, I was at the bottom and then I made my way to the top and there were steps in between. And eventually I reached this summit and they had these experiences. So therefore they'll say, so this must be true. This must be the genuine path. Never mind all of the discrepancies. And this is a very seductive thing because these experiences are happening. These people are entering a path, climbing, and attaining some peak experience. And they may even find that it benefits them. So they might have less anxiety. They might feel more relaxed. They might begin to remember past lives. They might have a variety of experiences that can be quite impressive and quite impactful. And people will get stuck on that. The Blessed One gave the simile of the heartwood to explain this. They'll take away the twigs and leaves, which is, say, the decreased anxiety and the relaxation aspect. And they'll take that away and and think that that's the fruit of the holy life. That's the whole goal. But that's not the goal. That's stopping very, very far short of the goal. And they'll fight very hard to maintain that. When they enter, in the case of Twim, at the bottom they're told, congratulations, you're a Sotapanna. Never mind the doubts that you have about that experience. Just forgive those, forgive yourself for not understanding and keep going, climbing up. And then they get to a point and they're told, you're a Twim Sakadagami. And they believe that as well. And they keep going. And then they're told they're a twim anagami. And in the case of at least one, this would be Delson Armstrong, he reached somewhere near the peak of this twim practice and declared himself to be a twim arahant. Likewise, if you have someone doing the Daniel Ingram core teachings path, they'll go through all these phases They go through the jnanas, they go through their dark night of the soul, their cycles of insight, and they build themselves up to this point where they have reached a peak experience on that path. And they conclude that this must be it. So in the case of Daniel Ingram, he declares that because he went through these steps and he hit these goalposts, that he must be an arhat. Even though when he looks in his own mind, he sees that he still has greed hatred, and delusion. His excuse is that, well, they must have exaggerated in the suttas, and an arahant doesn't really eliminate these things, so it's just making excuses. The thought doesn't occur to him that perhaps he did climb a peak, he did reach a summit of experience, but it just wasn't the one that the Blessed One was teaching. And likewise with Delson Armstrong, He declares himself an arahant, and he doesn't stop to think, would an arahant really wear gold rings and a gold watch? Would an arahant be overweight? Would an arahant be obsessed with proving himself via materialist methods, such as MRIs and EEGs? Would an arahant misrepresent the Buddha? None of this concerns him because he's already decided, just like Daniel Ingram and others, that whatever way he is, that must be the way an arahant is, 
even though the Blessed One made the parameters of Arahantship quite clear. And the Blessed One pointed this out. He spoke about the wrong path, the Mitya path, that leads only to wrong liberation. Each one of these peaks, which very few people are even getting to these peaks, it's not necessarily an easy thing to do, even if it's wrong. But the few people that are getting to these peaks, all they can hope to achieve at this peak is wrong liberation. And these things have proliferated over the years. Different sects arose which made critical changes to the teaching, damaging it, corrupting it, so that it was no longer effective. Then after some time of that, you had the fusion of the Dhamma and yoga. And this is all a very messy exchange that happened. But you can see that by the time Pantanjali's yoga sutras were codified, he had taken the structure of the Noble Eightfold Path and put this yogic Brahman spin on it, moving the goalposts, removing the truth, and just keeping the structure of it. It's like you could say that a lotus flower and a dandelion are both flowers with many petals, and they're similar in that way. But in terms of their beauty and usefulness, they're very different. And then all of these subsequent developments have been heavily influenced by that yogic tradition. So even though these things may be called Buddhism, they may be associated with Buddhism, large and critical parts of the teaching have been replaced with these yogic teachings and yogic views. And you see that corruption to varying degrees, but it is corruption nonetheless. And the reason the yoga path started out in the first place was that certain people saw the success of the Noble Eightfold Path, that is the worldly success, that people revered the Noble Ones, and they envied that. They wanted something similar, of a similar structure, but they couldn't accept the Dhamma itself. They couldn't accept the essential teachings, such as the teaching of not-self. So they took the structure of the Noble Eightfold Path and applied it to their own preconceptions, their own clung to views about how things should be. And so for over 2,000 years, people have been climbing these peaks, attempting to climb these peaks. Some small number of them have actually succeeded in reaching the summits of these peaks. And that was hard work. It may have taken them their entire life to reach the summit of one of these peaks. And if you've invested that kind of effort and hardship into something. It's a very rare type of person who can set that aside and recognize that they have not truly reached the end of investigation. These people that have reached these peaks, if they had sufficient discernment and integrity, they could see that they had not reached the end of investigation. So on top of a few of these peaks, we have Today, people claiming full enlightenment. But some of these peaks, they don't even do that. So if you ask someone from the Paak school, they may tell you that Arahantship is just impossible. Any noble attainment is impossible in this era because it's so degraded. The world has fallen. And they're not entirely wrong when they say that. The problem is that they're saying it out of pure speculation and not out of knowledge. But other of these peaks are populated by people with greater degrees of delusion who believe that they've attained some noble distinction, even though they haven't. Now, what's the problem with this arrangement? I've explained the state of the world today, but I haven't given you the full picture yet. The problem is that due to a haze of ignorance, due to clinging to wrong views, due to deception, due to the influence of Mara, These people aren't even aware that there's another path they haven't tried yet. 
and for one who has dissipated that haze, another path can be seen. So, for one who's made it up this peak, he can see quite clearly that all of these other peaks below are false peaks. They are wrong liberation. They do not represent any noble distinction. He can also see that this is the true summit. There are no other peaks. This peak represents the end of investigation. There's nowhere higher to go from here. But when he says this, and he tells someone on this peak that they're on a false peak, do they believe him? Can they see the true peak? No. They won't just take his word for it. And unfortunately, unless they will take his hand and walk with him over to the true peak, they'll never understand. But they refuse. They're so attached to these false peaks, to all of the effort that they've put in to attain that, that they won't give it a chance. They won't examine. They can even see from the experiences that they've attained on their own peak that these don't match what the Blessed One taught. They don't line up. They're incongruent. But even that isn't enough to get them to come down off of this peak and continue the investigation. And so it's very lonely on this peak. Few people even believe that it exists. Remember, this is the view from down here. People will say that they they see no higher peak than this. Certainly there are hints that there's a higher peak, but due to their ignorance and delusion, they can't see those hints. They can't recognize them. They can't discern them. So what is this peak in the back? This is the genuine, noble eightfold path described by the Blessed One in his discourses. The four types of noble persons, namely the Sotapanna, the Sakadagami, the Anagami, and the Arahant, are only to be found among those who have climbed this peak. 2,600 years ago, among the disciples of the Blessed One, there were many Sotapanas, Sakadagamis, Anagamis, and Arahants. And they all stood somewhere on this peak. Now, something about this that's inaccurate and can't really be easily expressed in this kind of image. Here, it looks like maybe being at the top of one of these peaks is equivalent somehow to being at the base of this larger peak, but that's not really the case. But for the sake of this analogy, this is what we have to work with. And there's a lot of effort and energy put into maintaining this status quo. All of the money, all of the resources, all of the attention is going to these people on these peaks, in large part because of their disconnection from the truth. There's a willingness in all of these lesser peaks to tell people what they want to hear. That may be the original motivation for the changes to the teaching that were made by the pioneers of these peaks is that they had something they wanted to hear. So rather than try to understand what the Blessed One taught, they changed his teaching so that it sounded like he was saying what they wanted to hear. So this is all the gurus and all the false arahants. All of them are telling people what they want to hear. And so they're flooded with support, flooded with money, flooded with followers. And it doesn't matter, these people, it doesn't matter how charismatic they are, how much gold jewelry they wear, what kind of stories they have about their 
vacations in the Himalayas. It doesn't matter if they sit on a golden throne, surrounded by tens of thousands of followers. If they don't know the goal, and don't know the way to reach the goal, then they shouldn't be listened to. The last thing that Mara wants is for anyone to climb to the top of this peak. So as soon as any fragment of the truth comes into the world, Mara works to distort it and, and turn people onto one of these inferior paths. Now, if you're still clinging to one of these false paths, you may be upset by hearing this video, but that isn't the way you should look at it. And those who are already disillusioned with these false paths will be more inclined to see things in the right way. You should see this as a great opportunity. There is a way. Awakening is possible. But failure is assured by wrongness, by being on these wrong paths. They only lead to failure. To see what you can really attain, you have to try the right path. And that is the Noble Eightfold Path. This is the right way to final awakening to the truth. Now let's take a look at what the Blessed One had to say about this topic. This is from the Danta Bhumi Sutta, Majjhima Nikaya 125. Agiwasana. It's as if there were a great mountain, not far from a village or town, and two companions, leaving the village or town, were to go hand in hand to the mountain. On arrival, one of the companions would stay at the foot of the mountain, and one would climb up to the top of the mountain. The companion staying at the foot of the mountain would ask the companion standing on top of the mountain, What do you see, my friend, standing on top of the mountain? He would say, I see delightful parks, delightful forests, delightful stretches of land, and delightful lakes. The other would say, It's impossible, my friend. It's unfeasible that standing on top of the mountain you would see delightful parks, delightful forests, delightful stretches of land, and delightful lakes. Then, the companion standing on top of the mountain, descending to the foot of the mountain, and grabbing his companion by the arm, would make him climb to the top of the mountain. After letting him catch his breath for a moment, he would ask him, What do you see, my friend, standing on top of the mountain? He would say, I see delightful parks, delightful forests, delightful stretches of land, and delightful lakes. The other would say, But just now, didn't I understand you to say, It's impossible, my friend, it's unfeasible, that standing on top of the mountain, you would see delightful parks, delightful forests, delightful stretches of land, and delightful lakes. Yet now, I understand you to say, I see delightful parks, delightful forests, delightful stretches of land, and delightful lakes. The other would say, But that's because I was standing blocked by this great mountain and didn't see... In the same way, Agiwasana, Prince Jayasena is blocked, obstructed, impeded, and enveloped by the even greater mass of ignorance. For him, living in the midst of sensuality, consuming sensuality, chewed on by thoughts of sensuality, burning with the fever of sensuality, intent on the search for sensuality, to know or see or realize that which is to be known through renunciation, seen through renunciation, attained through renunciation, realized through renunciation, that's impossible. Now this simile tells of two companions. One companion doesn't believe the other. Imagine how much more difficult it would be if the party who stayed at the bottom of the mountain considered the party who had climbed the mountain to be his enemy and refused to be taken by the hand and led up to the peak by him. Now this is another sutta that touches on the point. This is the Kula Saropama Sutta, Majjhima Nikaya 30. The Blessed One said, Brahman, it's as if a man, in need of heartwood, seeking heartwood, wandering in search of heartwood, passing over the heartwood of a great standing tree possessed of heartwood, passing over the sapwood, 
passing over the inner bark, passing over the outer bark, cutting away the twigs and leaves, were to go off carrying them, thinking heartwood. A man with good eyesight, seeing him, would say, Ah, how this good man didn't know heartwood, didn't know sapwood, didn't know inner bark, didn't know outer bark, didn't know twigs and leaves. That's why he, in need of heartwood, seeking heartwood, wandering in search of heartwood, passing over the heartwood of a great standing tree possessed of heartwood, passing over the sapwood, passing over the inner bark, passing over the outer bark, cutting away the twigs and leaves, went off carrying them, thinking, heartwood. Whatever heartwood business he had with heartwood, his purpose won't be served. Or Brahman, it's as if a man in need of heartwood, seeking heartwood, wandering in search of heartwood, passing over the heartwood of a great standing tree possessed of heartwood, passing over the sapwood, passing over the inner bark, cutting away the outer bark, were to go off carrying it, thinking, heartwood. A man with good eyesight, seeing him, would say, Ah, how this good man didn't know heartwood, didn't know sapwood, didn't know inner bark, didn't know outer bark, didn't know twigs and leaves. That's why he, in need of heartwood, seeking heartwood, wandering in search of heartwood, passing over the heartwood of a great standing tree possessed of heartwood, passing over the sapwood, passing over the inner bark, cutting away the outer bark, went off carrying it, thinking, heartwood. Whatever heartwood business he had with heartwood, his purpose won't be served. Or Brahman, it's as if a man in need of heartwood, seeking heartwood, wandering in search of heartwood, passing over the heartwood of a great standing tree possessed of heartwood, passing over the sapwood, cutting away the inner bark, were to go off carrying it, thinking, heartwood. A man with good eyesight, seeing him, would say, Ah, how this good man didn't know heartwood, didn't know sapwood, didn't know inner bark, didn't know outer bark, didn't know twigs and leaves. That's why he, in need of heartwood, seeking heartwood, wandering in search of heartwood, passing over the heartwood of a great standing tree possessed of heartwood, passing over the sapwood, cutting away the inner bark, went off carrying it, thinking, heartwood. Whatever heartwood business he had with heartwood, his purpose won't be served. Or Brahman, it's just as if a man in need of heartwood, seeking heartwood, wandering in search of heartwood, passing over the heartwood of a great standing tree possessed of heartwood, cutting away the sapwood, were to go off carrying it, thinking, heartwood. A man with good eyesight, seeing him, would say, ah, how this good man didn't know heartwood, didn't know sapwood, didn't know inner bark, didn't know outer bark, didn't know twigs and leaves. That's why he, in need of heartwood, seeking heartwood, wandering in search of heartwood, passing over the heartwood of a great standing tree possessed of heartwood, cutting away the sapwood, went off carrying it, thinking, heartwood. Whatever heartwood business he had with heartwood, his purpose won't be served. Or Brahman, it's as if a man in need of heartwood, seeking heartwood, wandering in search of heartwood, cutting away just the heartwood of a great standing tree possessed of heartwood, were to go off carrying it, knowing heartwood. A man with good eyesight, seeing him, would say, ah, how this good man did know heartwood, did know sapwood, did know inner bark, did know outer bark, did know twigs and leaves. That's why he, in need of heartwood, seeking heartwood, wandering in search of heartwood, cutting away just the heartwood of a great standing tree possessed of heartwood, went off carrying it, knowing heartwood. Whatever heartwood business he had with heartwood, his purpose will be served. This is the Michchata Sutta and Guttaranikaya 10.103. From wrongness comes failure, not success. And how is it, monks, that from wrongness comes failure, not success? In a person of wrong view, wrong resolve comes into being. In a person of wrong resolve, wrong speech. In a person of wrong speech, wrong action. In a person of wrong action, wrong livelihood. In a person of wrong livelihood, wrong effort. In a person of wrong effort, wrong mindfulness. In a person of wrong mindfulness, wrong concentration. In a person 
of wrong concentration, wrong knowledge. In a person of wrong knowledge, wrong release. This is how from wrongness comes failure, not success. From rightness comes success, not failure. And how is it, monks, that from rightness comes success, not failure? In a person of right view, right resolve comes into being. In a person of right resolve, right speech. In a person of right speech, right action. In a person of right action, right livelihood. In a person of right livelihood, right effort. In a person of right effort, right mindfulness. In a person of right mindfulness, right concentration. In a person of right concentration, right knowledge. In a person of right knowledge, right release. This is how, from rightness, comes success, not failure. This is from the Maha Parinibbana Sutta. The Blessed One said, In any doctrine and discipline where the noble eightfold path is not ascertained, no contemplative of the first, second, third, fourth order, that is, stream winner, once returner, non returner, or arahant, is to be ascertained. But in any doctrine and discipline where the noble eightfold path is ascertained, contemplatives of the first, second, third, fourth order are ascertained. The noble eightfold path is ascertained in this doctrine and discipline. And right here there are contemplatives of the first, second, third, fourth order. Other teachings are empty of knowledgeable contemplatives. And if the monks dwell rightly, this world will not be empty of arahants.